awesome. Uh, well, today on the Come Up with Katya, we have a very special guest. We have Greg Offner, who not only has a fascinating and motivating story into what how he got to his career up to this point by you know truly leaning into his passions and truly leaning into his voice. Uh, Greg's also a really the brother of one of my really good friends, Michelle, so that's really fun. <laughs> um, and Greg is a professional keynote speaker and has been a performer his whole life who at one point completely lost his voice. So we're, of course, going to get into that whole story and what how that moment brought you to this point. But Greg, let's dive into a little bit. I know that you grew up with a true passion for music, went on to study music, and then took a job as a sales guy. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I love the whole fact that you described this point in your life of having a double life, living your nine to five sales job and then turning it into this performance at the at in the evenings as a performer. Um, I think so many people can identify with that when they're trying to build a business or follow their passion. So how did that double life come to be for yourself? Well, when I started in school in, in college, my major was music. I thought I wanted to be a music teacher. Mm -hmm. And as I got a little bit further into the progression of learning what it means to be a teacher and what it's actually like to work as a teacher, I decided I didn't want to be a teacher. And so I found something that paid even less money. I started studying philosophy and psychology. Oh my God. And so naturally you graduate college with a hodgepodge degree with music, psychology, philosophy, all these bills start to come due. You realize that the food in the calf has to be paid for with cash outside, not just some student ID card anymore. Mm -hmm. And someone put the idea forward that because I was outgoing, because I was quick on my feet and enjoyed getting into situations where I'm trying to convince someone of something, I think that's a philosophy background mm. where we're arguing a lot in philosophy, that maybe sales would be a good, a good job for me. Maybe they also knew I was a bit ADHD and didn't want to be in the same place all day long. And so sales in that respect was a really cool job during the day. I got to go to all different sorts of businesses, talk to all different sorts of people. And the more persuasive and creative I was, the more I got paid. What did you but sell? Really, well, so <laughs> I initially started selling paper shredding services. That like yeah. they would ship out the paper that they have? No, or like we would show up with a big ass truck <laughs> that had a huge industrial shredder inside of it. And we would collect these garbage cans. And when I say garbage cans, I want you to think about the roll ones with the flip top lid mm -hmm. that you might have at your house. Those would be filled. There was a little padlock on the lid and those would be filled with paper, law offices, accounting okay, firms, yep. you name it. And we would wheel those out and the machine, you know, picks it up, dumps it in, shreds it all up. We give them a certificate that's like, yeah, it's all gone. That's official. And, and we'd roll. And I had no idea this service existed. I bet people are listening going, wow, didn't know that service existed. Seriously. What's even harder is convincing people who for the entirety of their life have just gone to Staples or Kinko's or Office Max, bought a shredder, put stuff in the shredder. If they had a lot to shred, maybe they'd bring their daughter, their son, or some college kid in and just sit there for days plowing yeah. paper into these handheld shredders. Convince them that they should start paying money every week or month to have some company show up and do it. And what's even tougher is that the ink is barely dry on my college diploma. And I'm mm -hmm. sitting here trying to tell CFOs of large companies that they're gonna get sued and have massive fines for data breaches if they don't do this. And how much was the service? that I'm right. Yeah, it like how very much nerve that be? Was, That's crazy. Uh, so initially, <laughs> initially it was $75 for the first trash can and something like $35 each additional, right? So it was okay. It was pretty decent money in terms of how we structured the contract and what we got paid. But that was contingent upon a lot of this paper being recycled after the fact. And so the company was making money on the recycled paper on the back end. Okay. So the prices weren't through the roof on the front end. But then everybody and their mom realized that you could make paper uh, make money selling paper on the back end. So they started to say, I'll do it for 50 bucks. I'll do it for 30 bucks. And eventually, when I wound up sort of moving into a leadership role, I think the first container was going for like $25 and then 10 each additional. Wow. So it was wild. It was this race to the bottom with pricing. Mm. And the company I work for since divested that division, divested another, and uh, a great company just decided to abandon shredding. 
So I'm doing this shredding gig during the day, you know, making bucks, got free time, love and life. Uh, but I was still really unfulfilled. I knew mm -hmm. that what I was doing was killing time and not really building something. And I just happened to fall into this job as a piano bar performer at night, courtesy of a, of a former college housemate. One night she called, said, my friend's dad's opening a piano bar in Philly. Do you want to come down and check it out? The grand opening? Yes. Friend's dad found out I played piano. Do you want to play tonight? Yes. Got up and did a couple songs. Came back to my seat. He walks over. He goes, so uh, do you want to work on Wednesdays? I said, yes. So now all of a sudden I have this day job where I'm corporate Greg with a tie and learning <laughs> business things and selling business services. And at night I'm taking requests. I'm having fun. We're drinking on the job. So you have I mean, an open bar tab, I'm sure. Precisely. It was this completely <laughs> different person. And for a little while, that was cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in my 20s. Who cares? I'm going to live forever. But as I, as I got into my 30s, it really became a chore to have to live those two lives. It wasn't fun anymore. It was actually frustrating. And then it ultimately became really, really damaging because I got to a point where I looked in the mirror and didn't know who I was. I was okay. trying to be somebody else that I thought everybody wanted me to be during the day, this business guy. And in a way, I joke and say that I was one of the like highest paid actors who never got filmed for anything because I just acted like I was a business guy. So sales Greg didn't really bleed into piano bar Greg. They were two different well, people. In a way, yes. And in a way, no. And here's, here's what I mean. That sales experience, incredibly valuable to anyone. I have lots of friends that are musicians and many of them can't rub two pennies together because they're afraid to go out and really sell mm -hmm. themselves to a bar owner, to an agent. So understanding anything about business for a musician is incredibly helpful. And the work that I do now is the opposite in sort of bringing music into the business world and showing leaders how some of these skills that I amassed as a performer can be applied to what their people are doing and what they're doing as leaders and really transform their business. Yeah. Never saw this coming, of course, and we'll talk about you know, why I'm in this position now, but it didn't bleed into the, call it like nighttime Greg and daytime Greg. Yeah. I mean, there was a very different way of even talking to people, uh, very casual at night and very formal at, during the day. So yeah, de definitely two different personas. Did your coworkers or some of your clients know or ever see you out performing? Not at first. And that scared me. Yeah. I was terrified because I thought these people are going to know I'm a fraud. Interesting. These people are going to know I'm a fake. And that's what I saw when I looked in the mirror. That's why I say, you know, at first it was fun. It was like, ha, 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 I'm yeah. leading this double life. And then it was like, all right, I'm, I'm leading this double life. And eventually it was, I cannot keep leading this double life. And that's a really scary place, I think, for anybody to find themselves. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people are right on that edge mm -hmm. between trying to be someone that they think everybody else wants them to be and in the process really losing touch with who they actually are. Yeah, that's really interesting of not being able to be who you are outside. Of course, everyone has to be like a polished professional. That's part of being in the business world or just conducting regular business. But to not be able to be your true self within those four walls and within that nine to five time period, that's that's really interesting. And I'm sure you encounter that all the time with individuals that you it's work with now too. Yeah. And now that I'd like to say I know a little bit better, and I'm sure I'll know even more in 10 years, but now that I know better, I know that those decisions I was making were made from a place of fear. Mm. And that's what creates the danger in that situation is that I'm not acting to gain, I'm acting to avoid loss. And so really, it's acting to try and mitigate change or stop change altogether. And change is, it changes how we know we're alive. If you stop changing, you're dead the breath goes in and out, your heart beats. I mean, change is how we know that we're living. And so I was quite literally trying to not live. I was trying to avoid change. And so that fear of, oh, I'm gonna be found out, I'm, I'm not gonna be me. 
I don't know that 20 something year old Greg would have listened, yeah. right? If I had a time machine and could go back and talk to him. But the message I'd want to share is screw those people. If they don't accept you for who you are, not in that very cliched sort of meme culture, I'm a be me type of thing. <laughs> like there's appropriateness in situations, yes, of right? Course. Come of on. Course. We all know this, but trying to hide that, which I felt made me different and therefore maybe um, out of place in this business mm -hmm. was actually what could have made me transformative for a business and could have taken my career further than I think I ever imagined. Interesting. Do you think that you, if you would have made that transition and that recognition, you could have been happy at that job? Maybe. I was happy. There were parts of it that I, I, I really, really enjoyed. Okay. Um, but I believe we all have something that we're here to do. And being in that job for me was a distraction from really diving into what, figuring out what that was, how, how I could be all I was capable of being yeah. in, in my programming. I referenced the old army commercial or the old army slogan, you know, be all that you can be. Mm -hmm. That was the longest running army commercial ever. The most popular slogan the U.S. Army has ever had. They've had several. Yep. That's the most popular. And there are generals who have been interviewed that said that could have gone on forever. And some are frustrated that it didn't. 100%. And then they stumbled onto like Army of One and Army Strong and Warrior Culture or something. Now, that was such a powerful slogan because it speaks to what we're all craving. To, it's not be the best soldier, come and fight wars. It, it, it's not be a general, they'll salute you. It's be all that you can be. We're going to help you do that. And for a time, that job helped me do that because I studied music, philosophy, and psychology. I had no idea how to conduct myself in the business world. I nearly got fired from this job. My, you know, my first real job, the first couple weeks I was in there, because I finally had a paycheck. I finally had money. I was going out drinking every <laughs> night. I was paper in this bar, <laughs> buying drinks and for people. And everybody was my friend, big surprise. Yeah. But so I would show up and I'd fall asleep in sales meetings. Oh my God. But I was this kid. I was the youngest kid on the team. So at first they cut me slack. And then one of the one of my coworkers took me out and had kind of a come to Jesus talk. He's like, dude, do you, this is a legit job, all right? We're not working at Chili's. <laughs> Nothing against Chili's. Love my baby back ribs. But I'm just saying, like, this is not a college job. This is a job you can turn into a career. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be here? And I didn't. But I was scared because I didn't know where else I'd go. I didn't know what else I'd do. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be here. And I just twisted a little more. Yeah. Faked a little more. Pretended a little more. And I was really, really good at it. But it is not really, really good for us when we act that way when we do that. So what's the dichotomy though of, you know, being in your twenties and saying, I have to pay my dues and go through those challenges of doing a job that is kind of a fit, but not your true purpose that you're talking about. Like, how do you manage that and also get to the point where you can truly find out what you're supposed to do? I, I, I want to understand more about what you're asking. The, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that there are two ways people learn. What I've discovered is there's two, there's two ways we learn anything. Mm -hmm. We teach ourselves or we're taught by the people around us. And if you don't have a strong direction, there's a good chance you're going to listen more closely to the people around you. Cause if you don't know, well, maybe they know. Yeah. And I certainly didn't have a strong direction coming out of college. I was kind of this like Renaissance man, my, my hands in a bit of everything. Thing, philosophy, psychology, music, I'm all over the place. So I sort of looked for people that maybe lived what I perceived would be a life I'd want to live or had the things that I thought I wanted to have. And I kind of just said, well, what are you doing? Oh, maybe I'll go try that. Bup, 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 walk over there, try that for a little bit. If I'm unhappy, what are you doing? Bup, 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 walk a different way. Maybe I'll go try that for a little bit. So it's really easy. If, if you don't decide, if, if I didn't decide what I wanted for my life, and I realized there were plenty of people that were happy to decide for me mm -hmm. and use it to their own advantage. Not always in like a very negative dastardly way, but people will use you to help get what they want. If you have no idea what you want. Absolutely. And I was not clear on what I wanted. What I was clear on going back to that acting out of fear, 
I was very clear on what I didn't want. I didn't want to be seen as a failure. I didn't want to be broke. I didn't want to keep accepting gifts and handouts from my parents, helping mm -hmm. with bills. I wanted to stand on my own two feet and do something that mattered. And looking at these people who were senior level directors or VPs of this company and what they had and how they were treated. And it seemed like maybe what they were doing was something that mattered and it, it is, but that's what mattered and was right for them. Right. I was trying to copy somebody else's purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of finding my own. So what was the moment then that clicked or was there a moment, I guess I should say that clicked of this isn't, this is not where I'm supposed to be. This is not my journey. Mm. There were lots of them. I just didn't listen. Okay. And so life shook me hard enough so I'd pay <laughs> attention. And so, all right, I'm, I'm bouncing from a couple jobs yeah. at this point. Not bouncing. That's the wrong way to describe it. I'm trying to find my fit in an industry because I stayed with that, you know, paper shredding company. They had a division that, that sold textiles and, and workwear and I moved into that and it was neat. But I didn't really care. Yeah. It's just you another know, sales great job. Great coworkers, great coworkers, great company culture, just not how I wanted to spend the next 20, 30 years of my life. And then I moved into this insurance product and it wasn't exactly what I wanted. And then insurance consulting, and that was really cool. Then insurance brokering, and that was neat too. But right as I moved into what I had told myself, what others reacted in a positive way to when I said, this is my dream job, right? Because there's not about, I still didn't know what I wanted. But when people heard I was getting this job, they're like, oh, well, let me lay out the red carpet for you, Mr. <laughs> Hoffner. That's fantastic. So I thought, well, this is it. Maybe this is on to something. So I got this job working what for was an insurance the job? brokerage. Yeah. Where, as, as I was a commercial insurance okay. broker, working for a very prestigious brokerage, very, an amazing company. I love LUV, this company. Really, really do. But I'm six weeks, six six, seven, eight weeks into the training program. And I still got this gig on the side, right? Doing, doing mm -hmm. piano bar stuff. That's fine. But talking all day and singing all night is like to your voice, what trying to run a marathon four times a week for a year is to your legs. It is punishing. It's really, really ill-advised. And I had not taken that into account. Later on that at the time I was a cigarette smoker and would go and drink at happy hour a bunch of times or go to sporting events and get, you know, let loose. All these things are damaging for your vocal folds. Mm -hmm. So in July of 2015, I was again, sort of living out this day job, working at night. And as I started to sing the first song, my warm up song at one of my gigs, my voice just, it went, it was almost like you feel a rubber band snap Okay, and it scared the hell out of me. Did you finish your set? I left the gig. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I said to the manager, I'm done. Look, you can fire me if you have to, but I cannot sing on this. Something is really, really wrong. And I went to go see a doctor the next day. And it was just the first available doctor. I didn't really pay attention to whether they were good for singers or not. Just do you have the device that can look at my vocal cords? Good, I'm coming in. And he said, you can't smoke and speak ever again. So you got to pick one. And I quit smoking that day cold turkey. Wow. He said, here's some steroids, like take these steroids, be quiet for two days, you should be good in a week. A week goes by two weeks go by a month goes by I'm not good. I'm passable. I can talk can't really sing not like I was singing this is not acceptable. So I finally get in touch with a doctor happens to be based in Philly, who is the guy when it comes to singers. He's worked on Neil Diamond, Tony Bennett, Shania Twain. I mean, you go to his office, it is the who's who of vocal professionals. And he, he does this very comprehensive one day exam. And he looked at my vocal cords and he says, I don't know how you're performing professionally, but here's the deal. You have so much damage that's built up over the years that's gone unaddressed yeah. that if you do nothing between two weeks and two months from now, you won't have a voice. It'll never come back. I can never restore it. So you have to make a decision today, right now. You need drastic lifestyle modifications. You have an acid reflux issue that's mm -hmm. contributed to this and we have to get a handle on that. 
And if you don't have surgery on your voice, it's going to get worse. And what did and you at that say? moment? Yeah. The, that was that was life pushing me saying it's time. It's okay. time for you to figure out what it is you want out of all this. And the thing that created that circumstance was me facing losing what made me me. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to trivialize anyone that's had a terminal diagnosis or that knows someone that has or that's dealing with something very severe. There's so many more things that are more severe than than what I went through. But for me, that was like a terminal diagnosis. That was a death like experience. If I lost my voice, who am I? Where is my place in this world? What it's it's in many ways. It's like what athletes go through when they have a career ending injury because right. their entire life is built up to achieving this goal. And when it's gone, there is no plan B. Mm -hmm. And when they look in the mirror and they see someone who will never again be an athlete. When I looked in the mirror and saw someone who would never again sing professionally, who may never speak again, I, if I had a gun, there's a really good chance I would have used it in that moment because I was at rock bottom. So what your brain automatically went to singing or automatically went to, I will never work again on any end. Yeah. It went to, I will never work again on any end. So okay. the, there were, I mean, it's layers. Anything that's complex, yeah. as you know, is, is layered immediately the conversation about surgery is like, cool, we're doing surgery. You got my Easy. attention. This is happening. It's funny. I'm watching that show. We crashed. Yeah. And I, I not, this isn't a spoiler, but I got to a point where there's a, a confrontation between the VC and the dude, uh, Jared, who let Jared Leto's playing and, uh, Jared Leto's like a clown the whole show. He's not mm -hmm. taking anything seriously. And the VC goes, do you understand that none of this will help you get funded? And all of a sudden you see a state change and he goes, you have my attention. Like, speak to me. What's happening? Yep. And in that moment in front of the doctor, I said, great. Surgery is what's happening next. Talk to me about what that looks like. With vocal cords, they need time to heal. And you can't do a thing vocally, cough, speak, whisper, without your vocal cords smacking together. Wow. And the minute they smack together, that surgical procedure is, is cutting into your vocal cords. It's it ruptures. Mm -hmm. It's like a cut on your arm that you scratch at. You'll 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 break it back open. So initially for two weeks, I had to be completely silent. They call it strict vocal rest. Wow. And what's going through my mind is I have a very big salary at a very important company that does very big things for very important companies. How and I just started. How am I supposed to justify not being able to do anything for two weeks? Right. And he said, well, here's the other thing it's going to take six to eight months for your voice to heal to the point where you can actually have conversations. Oh my God. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm not Adele because back then Adele was kind of going through some voice. Yeah. I said, there's no record label that's going to cut me a check for months while I recuperate. Mm -hmm. How, and, and he said, look, I can't help you with that part of your life. I'm telling you, this is what needs to happen. And, at the moment, it was financial because I had a home, 100%. I had a lifestyle, I had all these things that initially were important. But as the week went on, it became less about that. And I, I adapted, you know, when it comes to work, I adapted a, uh, like a, you know, we'll figure it out type of approach. For sure. And it became, I may never sing again. Okay. And that, that was crushing. Absolutely. So was that your shift? Was that your ultimate shift of not only do I have to figure out how to make this work and make my voice come back, but I have to get to this point where I incorporate song and singing into my, into my daily practice and my daily career. So the idea of incorporating singing or, or my voice into my career was fought was the farthest thing from my okay. mind. It was what does what does life look like completely modified? And and this is a separate issue. But I think for anybody who's listening, we joke when when we make the comment, and you know, if it's too loud, you're too old. But I challenge you to download a decibel meter app on your phone. And the next time you go to a bar for happy hour, or you go to a restaurant, we live in a, in a society where 
incredibly unhealthy amounts of ambient noise are thrown at us. Okay. So for me, with a lifestyle change, it meant I can't go to most bars and restaurants. Still to and this just day. just have a conversation. Yeah, still to this day, I have huh. to be careful. I mean, absolutely any bar or restaurant that caters to like the 20 to 29 year old like <laughs> yeah. mm's, mm's crowd is like absolutely <laughs> no not. It's, it, you may as well be trying to have a conversation behind a jet engine. It's ridiculous how loud those places are. It's very unhealthy vocally. But even, even simple things like standing outside at a picnic with ambient noise. Mm -hmm. The perfect place for me to have a conversation is in a quiet room. I mean, if a, if a box fan is on, that's a pretty loud noise to have to speak over. So, all right, how do I adapt to that? Mm -hmm. Really, no alcohol use is preferred, but I built my life around socializing. 100%. What does that look like? Um, so I started to make a bunch of lifestyle changes, and they were helpful. But it wasn't until the sixth surgery on my vocal cords and i've had 13 surgeries oh on my, my voice God. and two to rebuild a valve in my stomach so i think if i have one more i get a free t-shirt <laughs> by the sixth surgery this undulating process of they cut into your vocal cords six ish months later you're able to start speaking and then they see the next issue and they cut into it again Okay. Six months later, you're able to start speaking. They see the next. It was about that fifth or sixth surgery where I was seriously, deeply depressed and considered suicide. Wow. And when I say this, I don't mean to be dramatic. It was a very fleeting thought, but a very serious one, followed by that's not an okay way to think and it's time to do something about it. So luckily I have that background and understanding how serious that thought was and I have people around me who love me and I was going to say, how did you, did you, did you express that to individuals no. or did people know that you were depressed? No, I mean, people knew I was upset and unhappy because I couldn't contribute. I would generally walk around uh, with a whiteboard, like the kind we used to have on like our dorm mm -hmm. doors yeah. right? or I did anyway. And so, you know, you'd walk around with that. Um, so sort of like to, to reference a, a Philadelphia or, or a Jersey Shore, I'd be at the Princeton with people and listening to the conversation, I can't talk there. I'm furiously trying to write down on a whiteboard a joke. The more drinks they have, the less they feel like reading a friggin' whiteboard in the middle of the conversation. So I became very isolated socially. Totally. And you can't even express that. I didn't even think about that. You can't even express how you're feeling. You can't yeah, You can't talk. go to a self, you can't go to a support group because you can't talk to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I wish like AIM was still around. That yeah. would have been perfect for me. <laughs> Greg has entered the chat yeah. room. Like... <laughs> So I knew something needed to change. And I, so I, I, I went to a Tony Robbins event. Really? I feel odd. I feel odd saying that because it's such a cliche. Like, so I went to Tony Robbins and I felt that way about Tony Robbins before this, this happened. So okay. I was the most anti Tony Robbins. You can, you dude, you could have found, but I watched that documentary on Netflix. And I noticed some really sound and legitimate psychological principles being applied in some mm. of his interventions. And I was like, okay, maybe I got it wrong and this isn't all BS. And if I'm in a place where I need something to change, like what the hell, give it a shot. So I went and it was a three or four day event. And I will tell you, it followed this very predictable pattern that we all have whenever something new is, is thrust at us. The first day when I walked in, Everyone there is very rah, rah, high five, yeah. give you a hug, yeah. super high energy. And I was like, I'm good. Not, nah, please don't touch me. Don't want to high five. Don't need a hug. I have no idea who you are. You look gross. Let's keep moving. Yeah. Like just very like not about being about it. And you're probably in some convention center that's it like was, yes, bad lighting and you're like, hey, yep. this is awful. Yeah. And he keeps it like sub zero in there. So it's oh my God. freezing. Um, day two, I'm kind of like, okay, hey, all right. Cool. I'll, I'll do the jumping up and down thing. I'm, you know what? I'm here. May as well do it. Let's get into it. Day three, I'm high five. And day four, I'm hugging strangers. I mean, it was just a really crazy experience that I just let myself fully be into. But that isn't what created the transformation. It's while I was there, I'm standing in line at the concession stand and pretty long line. Mm -hmm. This person's in front of me. We strike up a conversation. Her name is Svetlana. She's from Russia. She had emigrated a couple years ago. Her family was were political refugees because of, I guess, something happened and they had to get out of there or else they'd never get out of there. And so she wound up here in the States 
and then started to suffer some medical issues and, and just was in and out of hospitals for several years. Built up a real estate practice that was just incredible. So you hear about what this woman is doing in the world. And I'm listening to her story and I'm captivated. And then she stops and she says, so tell me your story. I, I didn't know what to say because all I wanted to do was complain. Sounds like you're living your dream and I'm sitting here yeah. because I'm standing on the subway platform wondering if I should jump and I knew something needed to change and here I am and maybe I'm high-fiving people but I still don't have a direction. What, what am I supposed to do? That's what I wanted to say. And I thought, fuck it. I don't know this person. I'm going to say all that and see what she gives me. Yeah. Like, this is the place to get help. What'll happen? And she listened and smiled and asked really intelligent follow-up questions. And as I'm explaining to her, all these different aspects of me that are contorted or hidden or not fully expressed during the day. She goes, you don't see it, but I see all of these things that make you, you applied and intertwined. And I said, well, like, tell me, like, what do you see? And she points up at the stage and she goes, that really, that could be you. And it was this lightning bolt. Oh my God. How did I not see this moment in my life? And I went home that night and I started furiously like scribbling in this journal that I brought with me. All right, what would I need to do? What would that look like? What are the risks? You know, how would this look? What would I talk about? Where would I talk? I just, and I started to dig in. I was, I became obsessed with this idea because it's the first thing that ever really felt like me mm -hmm. and really felt like it would make a difference. And so I started to interview other people that were professional speakers, that were professional coaches, that ran consulting practices, that owned their own consulting practices. I asked them all kinds of questions. Anybody that would meet me for coffee or, or a phone call or exchange a couple emails. And after a couple months, I, I really thought this was possible. And it was flowing because it was the right thing yeah. for yourself. And and I, and so I said to, I said to my wife, I said, I think I'm going to leave my job. Oh shit. And she said, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think, I think let's make this like a time bound thing. I'm going to give myself till January 1st, 2020. And I'm going to leave my job. Wait, what month was this though? Uh, this was, I don't know, February of 2019. So you got like a year maybe? here. Okay. So about a year. Giving I was like, going to save up a bunch of money, yep. cut as many discretionary expenses as we can and just bank money because mm -hmm. gonna, I'm going to need runway. I'm going to do as much of it myself on my off hours as I can. Just keep my head above water at work. Just kind of hang out, try not to get noticed, try, try not to make waves and, and try to do as well as I can. So I have as much time as I can to build this practice. And Marcos, the owner of the company, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> I love you. I wouldn't have had the confidence to do this if I hadn't worked for you. Yeah. But this is the truth. And in June of 2019, somebody narked me out to my boss. No. Passed. I, I don't know how this happened, but they got a hold of my website. Oh, my God. And I hadn't been having a stellar year okay. anyway. But he called me into an office and he said, do, do we need to talk about this? Oh. And I said, no, of course we don't. No, we don't that's, that's a side thing. We don't need to talk about that. And he said, then you need to make your main thing your main thing or else this can't be a thing. And a couple of weeks went by and, and we had another conversation and, and it was decided for me that this wouldn't be my thing. Wow. And, and leaving that company in June of 2019 was the best blessing anyone could have given me because if I tried to start this speaking business in January of 2020 with only three months till the world shut down mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have had the ability to do it but because I had that six month head start and because I had a background in sales which is the most important thing for a speaker to be good at it's really you, you got to be a good speaker but if you can't get anybody to hire you it, you could be Oprah Winfrey and it doesn't matter. 100%. No one's going to know about you or pay you money. Yeah. So because I was able to do that, I generated enough money, enough revenue, enough paid speeches that leading into 2020, I, we thought, not knowing the pandemic was coming, coming I was going to make more money that year than I did in my W-2 job the year wow. before. Wow. That's highly unusual for speakers. And... And so we had the confidence to say, this is going to be our thing. 
Like this, this is going to work. And we had such confidence that in February, Kim and I said, you know, this feels like the right time to, to pull the goalie and try to get pregnant. <laughs> And then in mid-February, we found out we were pregnant. Mid-March, we found out the world was oh shutting God. down. And it was, oh my God, what have I done to myself? What's interesting too, though, is like you were living a double life again leading up to that moment. Mm -hmm. But what was different in this group of double life versus double life in your 20s and performing? I never thought that music as I was doing it once I had my full-time job was viable. Okay. And earlier I talked about strong people with strong ideas. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one, you'll have theirs. I had some strong-willed people in my life that when I expressed, you know, at 19, hey, I actually think I just want to say bag it all, move to LA. I know I'm going to wait tables, but I also think I can be around the right people. I mean, Been there. YouTube really <laughs> wasn't a thing back then. Like that was kind of the way totally. was you had to be in the epicenter of where things were happening to get noticed. So, you know, like 99, 2000, like that was my plan. But I had very strong and opinionated people around me that, that were louder than I was in saying that's not a good plan. And, um, and then as I got into the piano bar world, I could see where that could be a living but I couldn't see where it could be a lifestyle. Totally. Because lots of late nights, always at a bar, always moving. It, it's just, I, I, rightly or wrongly, I would envision myself at 65, hoping that someone paid me more than $5 for a request at a piano bar so that I could, you know, get the meds I needed. And it was just like, oh, that like, sounds like a dark. miserable, yeah. you know, way to do this. You got to have <laughs> something more stable, which again is operating out of fear, but that's another, a whole other lane we could go down. Um, this felt like something that could be built bigger. Okay. Because again, I'd were in working with Marcos and his company, I saw I saw what this looked like on the corporate end. I saw what those contracts were, yeah. how big they could be. I mean, you do this right, you're talking six and seven and sometimes eight figure contracts with global organizations. I have zero desire to be that big. I'm not gonna avoid it, but like that's not what I want. What I want now is to be able to balance my life, to provide an amazing impact on the world, travel while I do it and be around, you know, uh, for my kids versus some folks who go out and build a business and they're never around and then, and he's doing this and that. And it's, that's not how I want my life to look. So okay. I'm much more intentional about what do I want my life to look like? I don't care if Greg, you could be a $2 million earner next year. If you just do this, I, I don't care if that's not what I want to do. Thank you for the idea. Shut up. Totally. And it is that creates a sense of freedom that I never had in that other life where I was pretending on, on the AM and PM. And I think it's because clarity creates freedom. Interesting. I think it's because now that I know what I want, it's yeah. easier to say no to what I don't want. Absolutely. But when you know what you don't want, it's really hard to identify what the opposite is. Yep. So how did you manage the disruption of getting let go? Can we say fired or let go? Sure. Whatever you'd like. Sure. <laughs> Politely asked to exit the building Politely with your things. <laughs> brought a box of your things. <laughs> so you man how do you manage disruption like that while also knowing that this is clarity? But there's a lot of unknown that comes with that disruption. Uh, it's well, being comfortable with the unknown. That's the hardest it thing is. in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's a practice. <laughs> I think one of the gifts I hope I can give, this is a pivot, but I'll explain. I think one of the gifts I hope I can give to my daughter is the understanding that all of those kids she goes to school with have no idea. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are trying to fake like they do. And they're trying to fake like you're dumb because you don't know. They don't know. It's I a shell that, game. Yeah. And the sooner yep. you, my daughter, or me looking in the mirror, the sooner you realize that, this immense weight gets taken off your shoulders because you don't feel like you're left behind or that you know something or don't know something that they know. You just realize that they're an asshole mm -hmm. and you're not. And you move forward. That's uncertainty. I mean, that's really what change is. The difference between anxiety and anticipation is your expected outcome. So 
So if I thought things were going to be terrible with these vocal surgeries, that I was going to lose my voice forever, that it was going to go all wrong, I would have been really anxious, shoot my cortisol level up constantly, be living in a state of fear, and I probably wouldn't have healed as effectively. Absolutely. Instead, I anticipated how great my life was going to be when I healed, when the surgery worked, when things went well. And it, it just kind of, kind of worked out that way. Of course, I had great medical care. I listened to what they said. I mean, of course, I did everything that was within my control. But everything else, it's like, look, man, you lived a lot of your life trying to avoid the worst. What if you started living your life trying to obtain the best? Mm -hmm. Like, what would that look like? And ask, I mean, this is a Tony Robbins thing, but it's really true. Asking better questions. Yeah. What? If, I, if, if I continued to ask myself, why can't I get this? Why, don't, why aren't I making the sales that that guy makes? Why can't I get the promotion? Why can't, why can't, why can't, why can't, why aren't, why aren't, why aren't? It's all negative. Instead, you flip it and you start going, what would I have to do to get that promotion? What would it look like if I were making more sales? What are the behaviors? What I used to ask myself, honestly, when I first started, I said, what would a successful speaker be doing right now? And, and then the I just answer? did that. Okay. So, but how, how do you maintain to stay in that mindset? Because I think when, when you said that the one thing that you wish for your daughter is to tell her that people are bullshit and not to compare their, they don't know what they're talking about, not to compare herself to them. I totally identify with that. And I think I can speak for like women my age. We grew up in that. We grew up in that she has this and she has that and you should have that and not have your own path. So it's really hard to get into and stay in that mindset that you're talking about. So how do you not only keep yourself in that mindset, but also coach people to get there as well? It's, it's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And <laughs> A lot of it has to do with what you read, what I read, what I, what I digest. What you consume. Okay. Um, I, I didn't do it intentionally, but I really called my social circle and anybody who wasn't a passionate believer in what I was trying to do and that I could do it. You're not, not my friend. I just don't have time. Totally. I'm busy. Would love to see you. Don't have time. Busy. Love to see you. Don't have time. And I started to pursue very intentionally people that not only inspired me, but that could be inspired by me, that, that enjoyed being around me for that same reason, that we talked about what we wanted and not what we hated. Philly's okay. a very like hate, 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 you know, <laughs> hate town. It's like, uh, I hate the way to drive. I hate the Mets. I hate the Cowboys. I hate this. Well, what do we want? Yeah. What do, let's, instead of talking about what we don't like, let's talk about what we want and let's aspire. Let's. I think in so many areas of life without making this a, a big grandiose statement, like we need more aspiration mm -hmm. and less avoidance. Yeah. It's all about the other guy's wrong. This thing's wrong. Well, what's right. Let's talk about what's going to work. Totally. So it's very intentional. It's very difficult. I think that losing my voice also created that physical space from socializing that allowed me to do it. Um, and it's just positive reinforcement. And let me explain what that means. We are trained fault finders. Sure. All of absolutely. us have a part of our brain that is highly sensitive to danger. And back when we had to avoid being eaten by mountain lions, that was a really, really good part of our brain and a really, really good skill. Now that gets us into a lot of trouble and it trips us up. And so establishing a gratitude practice, intentionally identifying things that have gone right during the day that we're happy about helps keep in helps us keep in that mind stay, stay in that mindset um for me i don't know if you mentioned this if it was in our pre-conference uh conversation i broke my foot on the very last song of my wedding reception when i got married like dancing wasn't drunk just jumped up in the air landed funny and broke my foot and for the longest time as it was healing one of my things that i was grateful for was that my right foot worked okay. i would wake up in the morning and i'd have a boot cast on my left foot and I'd look at my white, my right foot, I'd wiggle my toes, I'd move it side to side, I'd sort of point it all around, and I'd go, <laughs> my right foot works, this is pretty awesome, this is cool. I'm really excited that my, white, my right foot works. And it's stupid, it is absolutely a stupid, stupid, stupid thing to do, but it's also stupid effective. Okay. 
Do you have shitty days? Like that you don't have a moment of gratitude? Okay. Of course. (laughs) So then what does that look like? like the first, like (laughs) April, May, June, 2020. Those are shitty, shitty days just lumped together. Yes. I don't know. It was kind of fun for like a minute. And then when you're like two weeks in, you're like, wait, no, this sucks. We're done. It was like a snow day for a while. Yeah. Yeah, For real. So then how do you get past? That's something that falls out of the sky that other people ski on that's snow. (laughs) Exactly. So, so, um, yeah, yeah. I have shitty days. I try to, I try to, um, keep them as short as possible. Uh, so instead of sometimes, instead of trying to plow through a bad day, if I don't have to just to prove that I can, I just go, okay, today is an ice cream and Netflix day. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sit here and do, and like, that's cool. Maybe this is my body or my brain saying, Hey man, you've been going too hard, you know, too fast. Um, and that question, uh, you know, what would it look like if I were this instead of why can't I be this? Um, what would it take for today to be a good day? What's something that could turn this situation around and look for that. And sometimes the answer is Netflix and ice cream. Yeah. 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 And it's like, so, all right. Um, I'll I'll share an interesting example of like, of of this in, in action. I, in the middle of the pandemic, some states were opening and some states weren't. And one of the states that was opening, I was invited to speak at a conference and I could not wait. I was like, I love my wife, but get me out of this house. Totally. Like get me anywhere but my home right now. (laughs) So I was excited, I traveled, it was a seven hour drive to get there. And I was giving a speech in front of 200 some people, which is not a big audience generally, you know, in terms of the people I speak to, but hell, it was better than speaking to my camera and Mm -hmm. my, 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 my virtual programming. Super excited. I go into this room. It's a beautiful room. The setup is amazing. This room pre pandemic would have held 2000, 3000 people, just a gorgeous room. Super excited to be here. The day of my speech, about 30 people showed up because it was a beautiful day and everybody else was excited to not be at the house. So they didn't, they just didn't want to come closing session. Didn't want to be there. Hey, I bombed. I bombed because I tried to put on a program that is normally appropriate in terms of how it's staged and, and, and my big gestures and my energy. I mean, it's good for hundreds and thousands of people. That's who I normally speak to 30, 30 ish people. Nah, man. It's like, it's like setting off fireworks in a, in, in a jazz bar. It just, it just doesn't work. And it bombed and I knew it bombed. And I was furious that it bombed. Did you know that it bombed while you're doing it too? Oh my God. And you're yeah. in your Anybody head. who's performed knows. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. And I had a seven hour drive home. <sighs> and I am the type of person that can absolutely stew about this for seven hours if I let myself. But I got in the car and I said, okay, you're going to. F- you're going to give yourself like five minutes to just freak the F out. Just obsess about it. Look in the mirror and yell about it, whatever you want to do. And then ask yourself, what could be good about this? Like, what can, what can this do for you? Cause if you ask the right question, you can find the right answer. Mm-hmm. What I realized was that I knew better. I knew better going on that stage and doing what I did. It was selfish. I wasn't there to bring value to that audience. I was there to bring value to me because there was video. I was going to get great video that I could use in a demo reel and damn it. I wasn't going to have something that didn't represent what my normal program looks like. If I had been there for them, I would have sat down on the front of the stage or walked out in the audience and just calmly said, look, we're gonna have a conversation today Mm -hmm. instead of me doing a big old program, fancy lights and things. Cause I think that's more appropriate for this. So why don't you gather in a bit and let's have, let's have a chat. Let's talk about this. That would have killed. Yeah, absolutely. But I didn't do that. So what can be good about this opportunity? I will never miss that signal again. I will never miss that cue. God forbid that happens again. I will walk out on that stage and abandon whatever I thought I was going to do and do what's necessary to be valuable for that audience. Cause that's why I'm there. Mm-hmm. It's not to get a great video. It's not for the Greg Offner show. It's not cause anybody really cares what I have to say. They care about what they can glean from being around me and these ideas for an hour. Yeah. And 
So let's do that. Let's talk. Let's not perform. Let's talk. So it was incredibly valuable. And I was like, all right, let's enjoy this ride home. Let's get some, let's get a hoagie and let's just freaking rock out for six hours. So, yeah. You know, in your, now in your job, you're speaking with so many companies and individuals about leadership. And I think so many people have always have been in scenarios where they're like, I'm checking the box with this job. I maybe don't know what my passion is. But then at the same time, there's a lot of people like if everybody broke away and wanted to do their own business, the rest of these companies wouldn't exist. So how do you help companies tap into individuals' personal passions to contribute to the greater good of the company? Maybe, maybe they shouldn't. Really? Maybe they shouldn't exist. I oh. think the problem is that too many companies get free passes. Wait, I love this. Okay. <laughs> Just because they've existed forever doesn't mm -hmm. mean they should keep existing. I mean, here's a great example. Let's take it. I don't want any company to fail and I don't have it out for any company, but let's use this as an example. Knowing what we know now, if we had never ever sat in traffic for two hours to drive to a job mm -hmm. where we sat on a computer for eight hours to then sit in traffic for two hours to drive home, knowing what we know now, if we never did that before, would we do it now? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. That's what I call legacy friction. This idea that we have to drive to work, be at work, and then come home is legacy friction. It exists just because it exists, and the will to change it, there's a lot of energy required to make that happen. It's why people park on the median in Philadelphia, because shoulder shrug, hey, that's just the way it is. <laughs> I have zero tolerance or patience for that's just the way it is attitudes. I think they deserve to be challenged at every opportunity. And so what a company th would, would be wise to do if they want to position themselves for long-term success right now is to make every process re-audition. Forget legacy. Forget, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Great. If we had never done it that way, would we do it today? Mm -hmm. No? Then it's done. Figure it out. Your job as a leader is to remove obstacles from in, from in front of the path of the people you lead. It's to get obstacles out of their way. That's your job. That's why you have the power and they don't. I always have think a about that with power. budgets too. Like I've never been a corporate person. I've never really done the corporate nine to five, but I have so many friends who are in leadership positions where they're like, oh, we have to spend this budget before the end of the year because we won't get it for the next year. I'm like, that makes no sense. You're, if you we're below budget, you should be rewarded. And then if you need more budget for items that will actually make a company in, in an organization move forward, you should be granted that, that it just boggles my mind. Or organizations have in many, some organizations have misaligned priorities. And I'll give you an example of one that I think we can all relate to. And then I'll give you an example of an organization that's doing it right. Why is it, why is it that you drive past any construction site and you see anywhere from 10 to 30 people there, but two to three people working? Why, why? Mm -hmm. and I have nothing against construction, but I'm just saying, why is it? Well, I can tell you at least with carpenters, my family having a lot of them, um, the first day on the job, you learn that you don't work as fast as you can work. You work at the speed the group is working. And the group is working at a speed. Generally, that group is working by the hour. There is no incentive to finish totally. a job quickly. Yep. So let me tell you about a company that's doing it right. There's a company called Spar Marketing. Spar Marketing, for lack of a better way to describe it, they are the ones who set up the shelves in drug stores and in other types of stores. So um, particularly like if there's a new over-the-counter antacid that comes out, right? They would go and take the old stuff down, rearrange the new one according to what's called a planogram, and, and boom, there you go. So Spar Marketing realized that if they paid their people hourly, they would be in these stores forever. <laughs> just forever. It's air-conditioned. Yeah. It's comfortable. They got soda. They got candy. I'm just going to hang out. They also realized that if that's how their people acted, 
the clients wouldn't renew contracts. Mm -hmm. The clients want you out of the aisle, out of the way of the shoppers, get the new stuff in, get the heck out, get it done. So Spar said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to estimate the time it takes to do a product reset. So we're in a store, three shelves. Let's say that we estimate that's going to take three hours. We will pay $300 for that job. If it takes you four hours, you get $300. Okay. If it takes you 90 minutes, you get $300. Now, the manager of the store, so Spar's client, has to sign off on completeness and accuracy. They have to say this person did the right job the right way for you to get paid. So we've got a project-based incentive for the line level worker and the store owner is, or the store manager is, is paid hourly yeah. or at least they're paid a salary. So they either don't care how long they're there because their pay is the same or they get paid the longer they're there. So the manager's incentive is quality and correctness and they're paid their hourly. So if it takes you seven hours to get it right, <laughs> I guess I'll make Sucks. more money. Yeah. <laughs> and the person who's doing the work is incentivized to get the hell out of there because they make more money for their time. What if we incentivized road work like that? The line level workers were paid a set, you know, I don't know, $50,000 per person for this job estimated to take six months. The foreman, the engineers, the architects, the safety people are paid hourly. They're given a bonus for every structural or safety issue that they find. Now we've got people aligned to move quickly and to innovate ways to work faster but safer so that the supervisors aren't constantly beating them down and, and making the job take longer. And the supervisors have no interest in getting out of there sooner because they're paid hourly. Totally. So they want to make sure the job's done right. So many companies could take those two examples and apply them to different roles within their organization. Absolutely. But they don't because it's tough because they're legacy systems. It's legacy friction. We've got to make these processes reapply. And that, from, a, from a, a leader's standpoint, I think is one of the, the hallmarks of a leader that's going to be very successful in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. is that they operate with a different perspective, that the way it was isn't necessarily the way it should be. So how do you take that and continue to grow in your business? Because I'm sure you have seen and will continue to see how your come up is going to evolve in this new venture. How do you keep challenging yourself? I, man, I didn't have to. The last two years, COVID did it for me. I developed the world's first virtual piano bar because nobody was buying keynotes. We needed an income. We needed something to do that was of value. And my client said, look, we're not, we're not paying for content. We got all, a lot of our vendors giving us free content just mm -hmm. to stay in front of us. But God, our people are depressed. And they're sick of bringing their dog on Zoom and they're sick of wearing, you know, sick of wearing their college like or their favorite sports tears. team's jersey on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I've got like a shovely. Yeah. <laughs> so they needed something to do. And I said, well, I got the piano. I got all the gear. What if I set up a piano bar? What if I did a virtual all request piano bar experience live? I could interact with all your people live. What would that, what would that do for you? Oh my God, that'd be great. Became our biggest excuse me, it became our biggest skew, like the biggest thing that we sell. That became our biggest skew. Wow. Um, but I'm also a disturber, like a, a poker of the bear mm -hmm. by nature. So I, I frequently rip apart my own processes and, and try to make them better, try to change them, try to see what could be more exciting. Um, sometimes to my detriment, sometimes I do it too soon and I make my life more difficult than it needs to be. Um, but it is... Also important, I think that I have coaches, everyone who is great at what they do, almost everyone who's great at what they do has a coach. I don't think enough business leaders, I don't think enough people have coaches. We, we tend to wait until someone gets a VP title or an AVP title to give them access to these you know, coaches or to transformational skills. We spend a lot of time in the first four to six years of an employee's life cycle, giving them very specific job related training mm -hmm. that if they left the industry or they left this position becomes less valuable or has no value at all. Totally. And I think we ought to flip that and look at the college model. In your first two years in college, you're taking mostly gen eds. Mm -hmm. No matter what you declare as a major, those are valuable to you. 
Well, what are the gen eds of business? Negotiation, gratitude, curiosity and creativity, understanding how to manage your financial energy. I mean, how many people show up? I mean, sports athletes, I just told you about myself doing it. How many people show up? They finally get a check. They're like, oh, baby, we're going to the casino. Let's do it. <laughs> and then the next week they're broke. And what are they thinking about at work? Not work. They're thinking about their bills they can't pay. Yep. How to manage their, their physical energy. Because if you're sick, you're not thinking about work. You're thinking about wanting to feel better. Or their psychological energy. If you're pissed off still, three hours later, the dude who cut you off in traffic, you are not thinking about work. You are thinking about that dude. And he is not thinking about you. Mm -mm. But we don't give access to our people for those skills. We send them to an Excel class, get better at spreadsheets. It's, it's just, it's backwards thinking that I believe is changing and that my, the programming that I do is designed to put that bug in executives ears Yeah. and get them thinking this way. And then they bring me on and we actually do the work together to help their leaders lead in this way. And the transformation is really something to see because people start operating with this opportunity mindset instead of an obstacle mindset. They're not showing up each day looking for what's messed up. They're showing each day saying, something's messed up and there's an opportunity there. Okay. Uber, Uber wouldn't have existed if cabs were operating effectively. Totally. Efficiently, enthusiastically. That's why Uber saw an, opportun uh, an obstacle and turned it into an opportunity. So how do, we, how do we bring that mindset into the professional world where we work? That's what I help organizations do. And then you find you find highly effective individuals who do want to work in a more corporate environment setting that are actually effective at their job then, it seems like. Here's the thing. Bigger businesses can run circles around me. Their ability to leverage cash is unparalleled. So, you know, you asked earlier, well, what if everybody, you know, leaves these companies? Mm -hmm. It is really hard to start your own business. It really is. It's much easier to ride the financial... Let me explain, not ride the financial coattails, not a free ride. It's much easier to leverage the velocity, the momentum and the financial backing of a larger organization to do something great out in the world. The challenge is getting those organizations to focus on doing something great. Profit is not doing something great. Shareholders that become billionaires because they invested in you is not necessarily doing something great. Those are derivatives. Those are byproducts of doing something great. And the problem is we have a lot of companies out there who think that that's what it's all about. Shareholder value and profitability. Those are important, but what problem are you solving? There is a very, I'm going to get off my soapbox after I share this story. There is a very famous cable company based in Pennsylvania that was going to merge with another very famous cable company based in New York. And the CFO of the one company was interviewed and they said, wow, you're really excited about this merger. He said, oh, of course we are. It was on CNBC. They said, well, this is obviously going to produce efficiencies for your company. Uh, programming efficiencies. He said, yeah. Technological efficiencies. He said, yeah. Financial and cost efficiencies. He said, yeah. The interviewer asked, so these efficiencies, will they translate to lower costs for your consumer? Mm. Well, I didn't say that. Which is basically a way of saying F you. Right. We're going to, we, and we got one up on you. And, and yeah, yeah we're, we're, we could charge you less, yeah. but we won't. Right. And while it's not about charging less, right, it's, it's about delivering more. It's the ethics of that statement and operating in a way that says we are going to gain an asymmetrical gain. We're here to serve the consumer if we're an ethical, mm -hmm. if we're a conscious business. Yes, we should make a profit. No, we shouldn't restrict how much profit you should make. But is the consumer benefiting equally, if not more? If not, maybe you shouldn't exist. I'm just saying. Totally. I love that. I love that. So there's been so many gems of wisdom in this conversation. But what I want to leave everyone with, and what I personally really want to know, is what is like the overall almost elevator pitch for individuals on how to get out of their own way and become successful in what truly fits them. Well, that question assumes that we know what truly fits us. Okay. And we often don't do the work because it's hard work to find out what truly fits us. 
So I'll give you an answer, but first I want to give everybody that process to figure that out. I call it root goal analysis. It's a really simple process. It's hard to do because it requires a lot of scratching your head and running into an answer that you're not really sure of and deep, deep thinking, which I certainly didn't do prior to you know this sort of change that went on in my life. So you just put a goal on paper. What is it that you want? What is it that you want? I want a million dollars. Cool. When I have a million dollars, I will become, or I will be able to, or $1 million will allow me to blank. Finish that sentence. Whatever you finish that sentence with, that's your new goal. And now do it again. When I have a million dollars, I will buy a Ferrari. Buying a Ferrari will allow me to blank, will make me feel blank, will make me feel like a winner, just to keep this short. Okay. When I feel like a winner, I will blank. I'll smile more. You don't need a million dollars to smile more. <laughs> we can get you there so much faster, but we put these crazy obstacles in our way. So assuming that you know what you want, the next step is to question your rules and assumptions. Because we have so many rules that we've created for ourselves. It has to be this way or I believe that the world works mm -hmm. this way. We get, and I think this comes from that conditioning that I was talking about Absolutely. with my daughter, that like they don't know. We get embarrassed at some point about asking questions and not knowing the answers. Some people do, I know I did at one point in my life. And I stopped asking questions and I stopped growing. And I created assumptions that weren't necessarily true that I didn't test. So maybe check, check our assumptions, check the rules that we've, told for herself, I can't, I can't show up in this way. I can't wear sneakers to a business meeting. You can't, what would happen? How do you know? Have you tried there so many things? And that's a silly example, but that is one thing that we can do to get out of our own way is, is a lot of our rules are made up. They're self-imposed limitations. Definitely. I've had so many and I'm still working to break through some of them. They're really powerful, but those are the, those are the things that the, when we get through them, that's where the magic happens. Yeah, because there is too at the same time, societal norms and expectations that we all have been accustomed to. And so it is hard when you hear, well, you know, the people who step outside the bounds, those are the ones that are successful. And those are the ones that can really change the world. But when you're not successful and you're trying to step out of bounds, there's a lot of people who call you crazy. And a lot of people will say like, Get back in, get back in your lane. Um, but it seems like you just have to be so grounded and in gratitude in yourself to find. So, those. like, here's a stupid, here's a stupid motivational speaker thing. But I think it's, it's tell me, it's all right. So, 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 put your hands up, make like a little triangle, okay. and then look like, through, look at, look at your camera with your left eye. Cool. Yeah. You got it. So your camera is framed in in that triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Now close your left eye and open your right eye. Okay. Can you still see the camera as well? I mean, not really, yes. Yeah, so the camera moved, but you didn't. Yeah. All right, you can put your hands down. Okay. <laughs> this is the problem when we decide to do something new with ourselves, is that even when we make a change and expect the world to be happy for us, we don't take into account that we just forced someone else to change because our position changed. Like you didn't move the camera, but the camera moved because you changed your eye. Mm -hmm. So when you decide to be more positive, that friend who felt better about themselves because you were normally negative, they feel even worse and they're going to take it out on you. Maybe they decide to join you, best case, but they're going to make it harder. So things get harder sometimes when we make these changes. These are part of those rules. Like if you got to get outside the box to be successful after enough time, everybody's outside the box but they're in a new box and you're the one who's outside the box right so it's it's all perspective it's all relative and those assumptions and those rules that we tell ourselves are very limiting sometimes sometimes they're freeing sometimes they're they're valuable sometimes they're valid you're probably not going to fly if you jump off the roof don't do that that's a pretty good <laughs> assumption and rule that we've told ourselves but if you want to start and get out of your own way check your rules and assumptions i love that well, Greg, thank you so much for coming on the come up and sharing your story and your wisdom and 
Yeah. I mean, you're preaching to the choir on so much of this of personally feeling a lot of this. So I appreciate it. My pleasure, Katya. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) 